Okay, welcome everybody. Our guest today is Christine Corday, uh, who is uh, an American artist who works with elemental metals to, uh, to make enormous objects. Often, they're not always enormous, but oftentimes they are uh, large scale, uh, that are meant to be experienced with all the senses, not least among the touch, right? Um, Christine is very interesting. She, she has no formal training as an artist. Uh, indeed, she began it as a concert pianist. Um, she then worked uh, for many years as a designer, am I right? Yeah. Okay. And the other, the, the lots of interesting things, but the other one I want to mention is um, she had an internship at NASA when she was in, in her early 20s, is that it? Yes. Early 20s, because uh, not having any formal background in astronomy, she wrote an original paper in astronomy and that got her the internship at NASA. So it's pretty incredible. Um, and I've asked her here today because to me, Christine really is the quintessential uh, uh, post-humanist artist. I, I really do see you that way. I think you're, you're a leader. Um, you're leading, leading the pack in many ways. Um, you know, it's her deep uh, engagement with her materials, but it's also many, many other things. And I think you guys will, uh, that will become clear over the next hour or so. Um, so we've decided to make this a discussion rather than a formal artist talk. So, you know, there's relatively few of us here. I think we can just have a conversation. Um, Christine's gonna show us some, some images. I'm gonna ask her some questions as we go, but I encourage you, you know, you all to uh, chime in with any questions that you have along the way. And then my plan is to leave about 45 minutes at the end so that we can just then have a discussion. Okay. Um, I'm recording, you're recording, correct? Yes. All righty. So let us, let's get started then. All right. Okay, now it's this thing where I can only see you. Hold on now. Okay, now I can see everybody. That bothers me. Oh, Arthur's coming. We'll wait for Arthur. Okay. Can everybody see this white rectangle? Yep. <laughs> Some words. You're on getting it. thumbs up. That's always good. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, Christine, so um, you began your uh, uh, career in sculpture as a painter, correct? So um, why don't you talk and you know, show some images of your paintings and talk about how they led you to sculpture? So um, these are the, the two pages that kind of to talk about painting. So I'll just kind of rest on, uh, well, maybe I'll rest on this one. Um, painting for me um, really began to change once I started to make my own paint. Uh, in the process of making my own paint, um, as we all know, making paint, you're suspending pigments in a, in a binder, whether it be oil or water. And in that process, um, I became less and less interested in what I was actually painting and I became more and more interested in the medium itself um, and the structure of it and the materiality of it. And it struck me one day as I was making paint, you know, imagine that pile of like an iron, black iron oxide or whatever and beginning to kind of grind that down with a muller. <clears throat> I realized that, um, I really wasn't manipulating the pigment. Um, as much as I wanted to get my hands on it, I was never really gonna be touching it. Um, all I was doing is essentially suspending it. And it occurred to me that that wasn't any different um, with any of the elements on the periodic table. Um, in essence, if I was to try to manipulate them, I wasn't really gonna do anything with them other than suspend them in states, solid, liquid, plasma, um, gas. And that's kind of where everything just started to click for me, um, was this idea of how um, this in, in tr truly large spectrum of pigments 
uh, are really just elements um, and how to be able to um, suspend them in different states. That became my paint. So in essence, um, even though I consider myself maybe more as a sculptor now, um, to me, it's all paint. So I'm still a painter. Okay. And, and metals are my, are my paints, are my pigments. I was gonna ask, are you saying that when, when you were painting, you were suspending your pigments in plasma or you're just giving us a list of different kinds of? Just different, uh, no. When I was making paint, it was a, a very traditional thing, you know, taking pigments and suspending them into water or suspending them in, in oils and, you know, making oil paints or, yeah. or making, you know, an acrylic paint. Um, and I just started to see that there was a relationship there in making paint that I could have as a sculptor with a full, you know, periodic table of elements as pigments. Got it. Okay. Um, I think you'll see in a few minutes that my question was really not so bizarre, given what Kristen does. Um, okay. So, yeah, great. Um, so this is Oon. Um, Oon was my, my first work uh, in sculpture. Um, the, I guess the physical measurement of it, if it's not obvious from the scale of a high line, um, it's about 105 inches tall, 103 inches wide, and about 197 inches long. And what that is really is, um, as I was further kind of exploring this idea of the elements as pigments, I realized um, that I would need to increase my mark making by starting to incorporate temperature. So what Oon really is, is a substrate, a canvas that has a single stroke um, that I curved so that you walk through it and you're kind of suspended in the mark making, um, that singular mark making. Um, Oon is 13 inches thick. Um, it's made of about uh, 20, uh, elemental metals. The preponderance of it is basically iron, as most steel is. Um, and I just started to kind of play around with the with the vocabulary. Um, in this process, <clears throat> this is just kind of like a detail of that mark um, using uh, temperature or heat to replace paint. Um, this is taking the elemental metals and suspending them in a state between solid and liquid. Um, and that's the space that you're entering and, and walking through is um, a form between uh, solid and liquid states. This was kind of fascinating to me as a sculptor um, uh, to kind of to work it in that way. So it's, it's literally suspended. That mark is right, bef right as cut becomes melt and before melt becomes complete you know, decimation of the form. I think, um, sorry to interrupt. I, I just was going to say, I think it's important to, to tell people at this point about your relationship with metal, okay? Your, your deep intimacy with what is it about metal that so draws you to it? Um, so as many things, I think in all of our lives, um, we have uh, maybe multidisciplinary interests in, in where our devotion lies. And for me, um, it, it actually began at the piano and then it continued on in astrophysics and then it was art, um, fine art. Um, and so uh, metals actually from an astrophysics standpoint um, is just a terminology for any element that's heavier than hydrogen in other words, helium, and then down the rest of the periodic table. And um, so there was always this use of the term metals all the time with me not really thinking about it much. Um, and then when I began to um, see the elements as pigments um, is when I realized that there was a great deal that I could do with the, the metals within the periodic table. Um, there were incredible tools that I could um, begin to employ, uh, tools of greater and greater temperature, tools of greater and greater pressure, um, realizing that I was using the same tools 
as the universe. In other words, the hammer and chisel or is temperature and pressure. Um, so um, metals became something that I realized I could have a tremendous depth of relationship with. Um, the plasma, the plasma torches that I worked with was working at temperatures of the surface of the sun, you know, 7,000, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. As a sculptor, I really kind of saw my studio with no walls and I started to venture out into tools that had greater and greater sense of uh, uh, material pressure, actual uh, temperature, like 40,000 degrees Fahrenheit was one collaboration I did with a tool um, that USGS formerly only used. And now, uh, as of last year, there is a tool that will reach temperatures of 150 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, a terrestrial star being built in southern France, uh, which art now is present as the 36th and final global contributor to the infrastructure of that star. That was a project I worked on for about six years. We'll see that. Yeah. See that. Um, but this idea of um, metals allowed such a tremendous depth and breadth of vocabulary in uh, tools that I could use in temperature and pressure. Um, they, there's so many layers to what metals are. Um, that in itself, I think, is an entire a book uh, of content, but um, uh, to me, it's uh, an absolute symphony of uh, decision making and uh, ever increasing and exploring tools or creating new tools um, within the multidisciplinary. So um, I don't know how far I should go into, into this. Yeah. Maybe now is a good time for you to talk about um, your relationship with your. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm blanking on the word. Uh, forger, who, who your your um, your husband, fabricator. Sure. Yes, fabricator. Um, so, um, I, as a painter, I I moved to Japan uh, and then I moved to Spain. I wanted to um, cite my practice in cultures that would inform the work on deeper, more profound levels than I found um, being born in the United States and having kind of those layers of experiences of what um, investigating a life as an artist meant. Um, when I got back to the States and it became clear to me that I was going to be working um, in metal, working in sculpture. Um, I just had a painting studio. Um, I didn't have any of the tools. So I set about meeting uh, foundries and individuals within the New York State area, speaking to about four or five of them, trying to find a resonant partner in which to develop these tools and, and to work metals in this way. One of the individuals that I spoke to was a gentleman who then in about three years time was to become my husband. Um, we've been married now well over 10 years. Um, and um, his name is, is Christopher Powers. And he works with a lot of artists, um, anyone working in uh, sculpture of this scale. Should I skip to the project that we got married over? Or Ooh, Yeah, 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 it's a good one. Okay, watch out people. Don't speak. <laughs> We're coming back. Um, so uh, uh, this is the National September 11th Memorial. Um, this is a project that my husband and I worked on together. Uh, this is a project that we also got married uh, during the fabrication and installation. So what you're looking at here is the north and south tower pools, which have replaced where the north and south towers were. And along that edge, what appears as kind of like a black border around both pools is actually where the 2,983 lives are um, memorialized. I don't know if any of you have visited this site, <clears throat> but the architect, Michael Arad, um, chose the fabricator uh, who was Chris, my husband, and installer. 
But for a few years, um, Michael Arad had some challenges in coming up with the color and the feel for what we call the bronze name parapets, which is the black that you see outlining with, with the lives uh, memorialized. And uh, I have a kind of a, a background in chemistry. <laughs> what don't I love about the sciences? <laughs> Let me just tell you. <laughs> right. And um, uh, I had the opportunity to meet with him. And I, I spent about six or seven months working with different labs and coming together with something um, that I presented to him. Um, and he ultimately chose as the color and the look um, of the memorial, which ironically was a formulation of a pigment that I created when I was in Spain, um, uh, which found an incredible application. But well, one of the things that we haven't touched on is touch, um, yeah. which is a great parlay right into this moment. Um, so all of my work involves uh, allowing touch, that full somatosensory sense of self, touches, you know, the largest, our flesh is the largest sense organ of our body. Uh, the National September 11th Memorial was going to be 15,000 square feet of touchable surface. And um, being that I work in this uh, with my own work, I was very familiar with what that would mean. So that also went into a lot of the formulation of the pigment that now coats uh, the memorial. And um, I was also in charge of applying that color um, through a heat process. It was basically a patina process with a little different aspect to it that um, is unique to the site. Um, and I wanted to pull together a huge team of like people from all around the world to apply this. And I got a lot of no's. Um, which surprised me, but I think it maybe was, it, it was quite something to kind of dedicate your time to. Um, and it was an honor for me and it was humbling. And I took it as a, a tremendous responsibility, but I was able to have an assistant. And so my assistant and I um, applied this treatment uh, to, the, to the full parapets, took about nine months. And then it opened in 2011 on September 11th. Mm. So that was a project that uh, my husband and I were working incredibly together as a team. And uh, we got married during it on Christmas Day, 2010. <laughs> so. That's that. And he's, uh, because he works in metal, um, it was this perfect um, entrance for me to understand um, metal as clay. Um, not knowing too much about it as an artist until I started to enter into it. It seemed very formidable, uh, immovable, um, quite solid, of course, right? And, um, but that's just one state. And being able to see through it uh, when it is heated to certain temperatures, um, being able to see uh, the, the different states, the different phases, material phases that any Thing, you know, any element on the periodic table can take. Um, it was just this beautiful entrance into what would become my vocabulary. Nice, nice. So you guys actually, you, you do this fabricating where you are at your place of state, right? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I used to commute. I was a, a Brooklyn girl. Um, I used to commute there every day um, to start realizing that first work, um, Sorry, people. I hope this isn't making anybody sick. <laughs> Un, um, which was uh, under the High Line first, and then it went to LACMA second. Um, that was the first piece that we realized together. Um, and we didn't date, just so that everyone's clear. We weren't <laughs> dating during Un. Um, we decided to date. Uh, I guess a month before we got married. <laughs> That's how that goes. <laughs> you guys were fast. Yeah, yeah. 
What a great piece. You know, earlier you said um, it's, uh, Una's essentially a canvas that you've made a mark into. You don't yeah. mean that literally, correct? There's nothing, it's just metal, correct? It is just metal, but I, I, I stopped kind of seeing, you know, everything was interchangeable to me. Um, I saw metal as the canvas. I saw, you know, um, elements as, you know, for instance, in order to make that cut, that's argon. Argon is an element and it was in a, a state of plasma in order to be able to cut through that iron and, you know, uh, copper and nickel and bits of chromium and, you know, all the things that go into making weathering steel. Um, so to me, it's just as a painter, I'm in totally my elements, you know, this um, the, the canvas and the linen join with the painting, you know, with the paints, this is all one act. Um, and, uh, I started, uh, seeing no separation between the act, uh, as paint or the act, you know, as a painting or an act of sculpture. Mm -hmm. Um, these were just all the same set of material and just different conditions. Mm -hmm. Always that. I mean, if I was to set my life in one sentence, <laughs> it would be that basically. It's all the same stuff, just in different conditions. Yep. Um, yep. yep. So what else are you gonna show us? Oh, and yeah. and that's, an, that's an important a point actually, because it also, earlier on, I was kind of using vernacular of projects that I saw as like intersections of art and science, which I would never say ever again. <laughs> um, because truly the multidisciplinary, we're, we're all sharing the same clay. So the scientist, the engineer, the mathematician, the musician, the artist, the, you know, the writer, we're all using the same material. We're all sitting around the same table, the studio table, and we're all looking at the same clay. So for me, the idea that uh, having a perspective where I'm just looking at my own seat, or I could have the perspective of realizing I'm just looking from the material and seeing all the seats, you know, um, around the table. So for me, I kind of switched it. I, I just became completely material focused. And then from being material focused, every seat around the table became part of what was happening with the piece. Um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's great. Um, one thing I want to, I just, you know, go in there and uh, throw in some questions that I have for you in the middle of your, do you want to finish up showing the images or should I just do this now? Um, well, actually, since we're on this slide, I, I have this little prompt here, right? Which is, hold on a second, I, my own things are covering it. Um, human scale either terminates at the end of the finger or includes the finger with every atom of the universe. So one of the things that right out of the gates, um, I was started to be known doing monumental sculpture. Um, let me see if I can get to one of these. This is a piece in San Francisco and the Civic Collection of San Francisco. Um, but honestly, I, I don't think I could ever make anything really that large relative to earth in my mind. So <clears throat> it's never really about that. What it really is about is this idea of redefining what human scale is. You know, we, we know these stories of Mark Rothko, you know, painting these gorgeous uh, monumental planes and yet writing about how he felt shut outside um, from those planes. So it's not really about that measurement because human scale to some people, it's, a, it's like a sliding scale of awareness. Human scale for some can end at the end of their finger. In other words, that idea that uh, your scale is insignificant uh, in the cosmological scale. Um, that intimidation of thinking of the scale of the solar system, you know, uh, the galaxy, the, you know, the universe at hand. Um, but I, I never felt that way. And maybe that's because <laughs> I had the beginnings that I did um, working so closely um, in, in astronomy and astrophysics, but I never saw it that way to me because understanding from a scientific standpoint, 
um, the atoms in my body once were atoms within a star. Um, uh, in that way, uh, everything basically is just a material phase of a sun. Um, but that uh, human scale for me is not terminated at the end of one's finger. It is, includes the finger with every atom of the universe because there is quite an intimacy to the provenance of matter. <laughs> All matter uh, once began adjacent to each other, what I consider touching. It's not really touching, but adjacent. Mm -hmm. So right off, you know, right off the get-go um, from the creation of this particular universe, um, there is this intimacy that's completely indifferent to scale. Mm -hmm. um, but within that is uh, your body <laughs> at one point in time. So there is nothing insignificant about that. It's tremendously significant. Um, and it's just scientific fact. There's no mention of unicorn here. <laughs> so... Um, that, that's that. important that's important to me and that's important to the work um is this uh questioning and redefining of of human scale because not all my work is that big <laughs> let's see some smaller pieces so um these pieces well let's just go right to maybe the smallest piece i've done which Ooh, is the that. most recent piece so this is, um, what you're looking into is this 400 acre site uh, named Eater. It what? is a- yeah. uh, Can you tell everybody what that means, Eater? Not everybody knows. Sure, I well, yes, it, it's Latin for the way, but it is basically uh, the world's largest nuclear fusion site uh, realizing the world's largest tokamak. Um, it was a project uh, started by Reagan and Gorbachev in the 80s. It has been 30 some odd years in the making. Uh, 35 countries have joined in to um, create this work. Um, and when I found out about it five years ago, uh, I was surprised that I hadn't known about it back when it started in the 80s, and maybe some of you are already familiar with this project, but it captured my attention for many reasons. Uh, one reason was, um, of course, I'm going to be attracted to something as deeply devotional as 35 countries realizing a project that's already taken 30 years. To me, there's a, a certain pace um, that is akin to the evolutionary, like in the cosmological sense, that I think is so healthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so healthy to, um, for a moment, you know, when we read a sentence in a, in a history book, of course, we know that that sentence might have been an elapse of 10 years. But just to sit with that and to slow yourself into what that meant um, to me is no different in these types of um, uh, pursuits that have to go through several generations of, of humanity, passing a torch on to somebody who may never see it realized. But this project, um, when they chose to make it in southern France, was only about 10 years ago. And since then, that top photo starts to show kind of where it was around um, oh, I don't know, five or six years ago. And that's when I became familiar with the project. Um, but I, I definitely, uh, just to kind of go back on, on what they're doing here. So um, there's a holy grail of energy. And there's this, been this desire to demonstrate or prove the power of the sun. And that's what nuclear fusion is not nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is kind of how we as humans try to kind of short cheat the process of what was gonna be truly difficult of demonstrating um, power of stars by building one. And there's many small ones around the world, but this one is built to be utility scale. In other words, what it would take to run an entire city um, off of its size. And, um, 
so I, I became very interested in this idea, especially since in my studio, I'm constantly talking about um, everything being a material phase of suns. The idea that we were building one on earth got my full attention. And for me, something that I thought was very important was uh, deeply believing in the multidisciplinary of the medium, the shared medium. Um, I felt that art um, should have a presence, but uh, it, to me, it would be art with a capital A, art without being an artist, um, art in the sense of um, this collective moment that is advancing civilization. And so I, I started to speak with some of their directors about how art could be present within the infrastructure of this site to have an untitled material moment that could uh, essentially be considered from art standpoint, a sculpture, but from the uh, site itself, it is a structural object supporting the heart of the star. And it was a six year project and we found an appropriate object. Um, and this object shared um, a, what I consider an elemental architectural uh, resonance with the site, which is essentially a very specific bolt that is the very first non-nuclear object that surrounds all the nuclear objects of this, of this site. So it would be the very first area where I would even be permitted to consider. Keep in mind when I first made my phone call to them six years ago, I thought for sure, it, look, let's talk about an outlying office building. I don't care where it is. Um, but they were the ones who continually brought me closer and closer and closer to the tokamak, which was such a pleasant and exciting surprise every time the project got closer and closer. So they brought me into the very first piece that's considered non-nuclear, which is this bolt that is, uh, creates the, the structure around the tokamak. So what was interesting about the bolt from a structural standpoint, and this was something that we talked about together, the uh, site directors, the building directors, the physicists, the communication people, as we were developing what object in the blueprint that uh, art would devote. Uh, the bolt has a shared language with the stars and also the tokamak, it, and that's the helical twist. So we all know the helical twist with the bolts, but there is a helical pulse that also takes place within the tokamak, within the plasma that is pulsing, that is replicating uh, the power of a sun, quite literally. And then the sun itself, its magnetic fields twist inside, which generate um, its power. So it was a perfect object. And, uh, there was a lot of rigorous testing, uh, which I'm very accustomed to uh, dealing with these tools. And um, uh, it was a remarkable process uh, that the director general decided that he wanted to install by hand. And the only rule that I had was uh, no one is to know the exact location but of course they knew and they recorded it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that it is uh, an anonymous work, which is why it's called Sans Teeter, um, uh, that it is a work of art, not artist, and uh, that it is forever permanently suspended within the support of our terrestrial star. So um, to me, this is kind of where the work is headed, are these very strong, um, uh, nearly untitled anonymous acts um, and anonymous now is kind of taking a larger term. Um, I mean, uh, sometimes uh, I will be attached to it, I suppose, which is what happened here. But uh, in the general sense, that's not how I speak about it. But I, I definitely see that this moment in time is one where the multidisciplinary is um, having its say. And with that, it is all the archetypes together um, focused on the material and the advancement of that material. 
um, uh, because at the end, you know, atoms don't live or die. The human body does. I don't have any interest in having an internal human body, you know, eternal human body, but it's already amazing enough that, um, you know, we were once this, you know, these atoms in our body were once the atoms of a star and, uh, and so on and so on. Um, so that's kind of where my focus, my focus is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's one of the things I find, I think most beautiful about your practice is your interest in anonymity. Um, Cause I, I have a hard time um, tell, explaining this to people, but that's kind of where I, I see, what I see is the future of art, you know, for it to become, Left for the artist to become less the point, right? Oh, that's decentering the artist and and really just you know having it be about the art and the experiencer, which I love you that you use that word rather than viewer, right? Yeah. So can you say a little bit more about what anonymity means to you? Um. Oh well, anything else it becomes so shallow. It's so insufferable. It's so insufferably thin that it it falls apart immediately. Um. Um, I suppose I can say, um, perhaps, I mean, we've kind of just spent out this idea of the individual ego, um, or, or maybe we're just in these like cycles over and over and over and over again. That's probably the truth of it. But, um, I'm happy to be alive during what I think is the down cycle (laughs) of what might be an up cycle of another another phase of anonymity, Um, this shared focus of the multidisciplinary on uh, a shared subject, uh, on the shared material. Um, And for me, that's where the the mark is hit. Um, uh, There's something truly beautiful about being human. You know, one of the things that I think about um, specifically and how I began with the piano is I thought about how uh, you know, at the premiere of Beethoven Ninth, um, it had been 10 years since Beethoven had taken a stage. And um, to think of that evening, to think of how he composed that evening, uh, the scale in which he, he designed that evening, and to think of the eruptive uh, several standing ovations uh, afterwards, um, and that the entire thing was recorded, um, but it was recorded within the human bodies. Uh, that experienced it, which means that that recording dissolved with that body. Um, But the atoms didn't. (laughs) Um, So there's something very interesting going on about, um, I mean, we could talk about closed systems. We could talk about, um, you know, uh, what all that is. But for me, um, there was this sense of, I think that's where anonymity in a way arises is um, the body does have a tool, um, but only so much as the whole and uh, where that goes. So um, I I think I get less and less focused on uh, the individual and uh, more focused on uh, maybe the intent of, of, uh, of the material. Uh, And so uh, I personally can't really operate very far uh, individually. Uh, but when the focus is on the material, the focus is on the idea, those ideas, I, you know, are, are boundless and the, the scale is, is extraordinary. And then it never still rests on individual egos. It's still out ahead of all the egos that are working on it. So it, I think it stays in a really good spot that way out ahead um, and doesn't rest on, doesn't rest on any ego, especially with some of these projects that are never really, you know, um, finished within an individual's lifetime. Maybe that's another reason why I'm so interested in some of these hugely devotional acts. Um, And that's also where space is too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, do you have more images to show us, Christine? Because we're, we're at uh, about 45 minutes left. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, okay. 
Uh, I think I've been talking a little bit about temperature, right? Those different tools, some of them, the surface of the sun, some of them 40,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which to give a scale of that, that's the early meteoric uh, impact, Hadean earth where material is just getting um, uh, turned over at the surface, right? That beginning of earth, that's 40,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the 150 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is what ITER will be doing. Can you imagine how we've been able to advance our tools to be able to realize something like that? Towards the end of these objects, um, these are just a series of objects that are literally based off of a temperature and pressure um, informing a material. This is um, a 10,000 pound object, but it is a 10 inch thick, uh, 12 foot long billet that was heated to 200, I mean, 2,150 degrees Fahrenheit, and then was applied 6,500 pounds of pressure um, per square inch to fold it in half. So, these pieces are just varying temperatures and pressures. Um, there's no privileged view, although I only have one view of it. Thanks artists for being so inconsistent. <laughs> um, and so then with that, then came uh, this recent uh, show, um, museum show in 2019, where I kind of, just let temperature out of out of the range of this work. This work was completely pressure oriented. So these are um, these cylinders that are compressions of iron grit. Um, it took about two and a half years for me to figure out how to do this with several partners. Um, but these are compressions. Um, they're not cast works or fabricated works. They are compressions of iron grit. Um, and they are about 53 inches in diameter and about 49 inches along. And each cylinder ends with this very subtle point. Um, this is basically just a, as the title relative points. Each one is pointing at the center of a centerless universe. Um, and um, yeah, an eater. And there's a, a project I'm doing with Dr. Andrea Ghez, who just won the Nobel Prize in physics. <laughs> she is amazing. I don't know any of you know her or are familiar with her work, but um, she started off at, at a younger age with her research, realizing that most stars begin as twins. That's the subject of our next collaboration together. But what she won her uh, Nobel Prize for is her work in a, uh, adaptive optics which is another thing between the astrophysicist and the artist, which is how to observe what you cannot see. So this project is going to be a work that takes place in the mesosphere of the earth. And that's in 2023. And if you're interested, I'll keep in touch. I'll tell you how it's going. Um, and that one is another, uh, another thing of um, uh, it's, the subject matter is sodium and uh, sodium lasers uh, casting sodium atoms in the mesosphere. Anyway, it's a, kind of a neat piece. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. I, I, this was kind of an unconventional um, way to set up things because it's more conversational, but um, these are just kind of a, a series of things that I'm happy to stop on any particular image. Um, oh, that crazy Tron looking thing. <laughs> that's, that was uh, one of the material, uh, one of the tools I was using in order to um, handle uh, and, you know, pound these objects that had like 6,500,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Uh, this other one is just more of what my studio looks like above. That's a day in the life there. And um, to the left is the installation of, of Genesis in, in San Francisco.
again, what you're seeing there is that moment between uh, of an element between uh, between states, between solid and liquid. Held in. Hmm. So this is a um, this is part of the abstract construct series. This is a project uh, currently uh, going on in Los Angeles. Um, these are self-maintained, self-sustainable forms. Uh, their water runoff enters into the public works. Everything about them enters into the public works. Um, so it's a very crude form of AI. <laughs> Yeah. That's great, Christine. Should we just, should we open it up? I just want to say one final thing before, before, which is that you have a very unconventional and refreshing relationship with the commercial art world. Oh it's yeah. Utterly indifferent. I just admire the hell out of you for that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, so do you want to stop sharing so we can all just look at each other? Sure. Sure. So Jane, did you want to say something? I was clapping, but I, I also could say something. <laughs> that was really, really wonderful. Thank, thank you, Christine. Um, I don't know if I should start, but I'll just say, I'll just say one thing about the, um, the Genesis piece. I just wanted to ask you about that because of, I wanted to ask you about the gap. Was there a gap there between the two pieces? And um, because um, I don't know if you know Michel Serre, he's like a philosopher, poet, yeah. And he wrote this great book, Genesis, about the question is how, if everything is sort of processual and a flow, how is it that things, how is it that things emerge out of the, the more amorphous um, flow? And so I wanted to ask you about why the gap, um, is it to mark the movement from the everything to the specific something? Um, yes, yes. Uh, there, there was several layers of, of the reasoning behind that. Um, the, the original form actually was a, a, a complete arc with no interruption. And there was the section that I melted um, that you could traverse. Um, then there was a real, uh, you know, you have to get involved with the American Disabilities Act. You have to get involved with many different, um, departments of public work. And, uh, it was decided as a team that that really wouldn't be in the best interest of the longevity of the site to have it be that way. So then it was kind of back to the drawing board. So this is just full transparency of the process. <laughs> so then I thought about, um, to your point, um, although I was not using that as a, as a muse or, or uh, a launching board, um, but there, there was an idea of uh, inseparability and separability. Uh, I don't have an image of it, but the, the piece actually has been sheared um, it's like this melted sheared and um, uh, there's definitely this statement on um, kind of when I was getting back to with the astrophysicist and the artist about how to observe what you cannot see. Um, certainly, materially speaking, we are connected even when the form doesn't appear to be. Um, and we're connected, obviously, because we all share the same material um, just in different conditions. So that's where that was. So thank you for that question. Um, that's great. It, it's good because you have to, I mean, sometimes the answers are kind of nice and poetic and sometimes they're just kind of a combination of, oh yeah, <laughs> and poetic. <laughs> but that was a real world thing that happened and uh, it changed the concept, but it was able to, to say more. Yeah, I, I loved your idea that there was an intimacy completely indifferent to scale. Yes. Awesome. That's one of my favorite phrases. Yeah, it's excellent. <laughs> T-shirt. <laughs> Just kidding. Or maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. I love that. That's like one of my favorite things. It's one of my favorite things. And I hope I, and I, I mean, that one, I think I could just 
I don't know, make another hundred years of work from, you know, yeah. in itself. Yeah, because there's so often the criticism of this kind of work yeah. um, is that, you know, you're not paying attention to the differences in scale and yeah. Yeah, how? Take that. Yeah. <laughs> Christy, I just want to say, I just want to make sure you know that um, uh, Jane Bennett is the author of the book I just gave you last week. Oh my goodness, of course, yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. My, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So much in common. Stephanie. I have, I have a lot of questions and, and, and it's actually very hard for me to sort of figure out which one to ask you. Uh, so I'll go with maybe the simplest one. Um, when you were talking about uh, the bolt, your sense teacher, and you were talking about it as, you know, the art, and you wanted to bring a piece of the art. Uh, in looking at the piece, right, uh, and you also refer to it as a bolt. So I wanted to ask you, where, where were you situating the art or the artfulness of that piece? Uh, I mean, I don't know if you know, there's an oldie, but a goodie, um, uh, George Kubler's The Shape of Time from, from the early 60s. Uh, George Kubler was a Yale art historian, developed uh, pre-Columbian art history as opposed to pre-Columbian anthropology so in the shape of time which is a very short volume you might be interested in he talks a lot about distinguishing artworks from tools and and one of the i i, I love in this one passage when he talks about um a tool no matter how complex is is simple you know you sort of think about you know a rocket ship you know, this unbelievably complex machine, but it ultimately has one purpose, you know, to get from here to up there. Whereas an artwork can be extremely simple, but is infinitely complex, primarily because of it being sort of multivalent in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but when you were talking about, you know, Santitra, um, and talking about it, you know, in the context of it being art, where, where were you situating its artfulness? That's an excellent question. Um, maybe I should just begin back with kind of how it started and see and see where we go go with it, because um, I want to make sure that I am answering it completely. What what prompted me with the idea that art needed to be present came from this sense of that the multidisciplinary is all seated at the same table and we're all looking at the same material. As a sculptor, it became very interesting to me that we're all working with the same fundamental clay. It became interesting for me to kind of blur and form and reform these definitions from a practical point of view, which in the end, many times in working with entities that have never worked in art before, or this was, this was a lot, this was a lot for me to enter into this conversation. So it entered into that conversation with art is at the table. Let's look at the blueprint for a place for art to make a contribution. Pretty abstract. <clears throat> uh, because the manner, some of the first ideas um, were not to replicate an object, but to have an understanding of what was happening structurally and then to, to make a work for that, not functionally, this is kind of abstract, but we would know it when we saw it. Um, but the practicality of it came down to, it was going to need to replicate a specific object. From that point, then I interjected that that object would need to be 
replicated um, so that the artwork became anonymous in its repetition, that the, uh, it would not have singular purpose, but its purpose would be shared among many. So um, in other words, an object that there wasn't one of, but an object that there was many of. This particular object has 80,000. Um, this is in a, a mechanism that has billions of, of components. So this was considered rather um, intimate of an object that only had 80,000 <laughs> scales. <laughs> We're indifferent to scale. <laughs> Um, and then from there, um, I would, um, interject like another stage of the process, which was kind of making, uh, the blueprint more abstract from an art standpoint and starting to look where art can contribute, um, in language and shared material. Uh, then that's the idea where the helical came in and then it was just a given, um, that we would be moving into something that was a fasten, a fastening object. Um, then they chose that it was going to be that very first M30. Um, then from there, uh, you know, the, the idea of abstracting the form, um, leaning more into what we would consider artful, uh, I actually enjoyed leaning back into the replication of the tool and being focused on intention so that there was this idea that there is a materiality to intention. We're all looking at the same fundamental clay. We're all working with the same fundamental clay. And this is the artist working with that fundamental clay. Um, and so therefore, uh, it was intention there the the object you would hold up sans teacher with an m30 bolt and you visibly wouldn't see any difference and it was both went through the same tests but the idea that sans teacher uh the only difference was that of intention um uh and this is the first of what will become many 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 projects there's one right now that I'm working on with um, ESA and uh, a group of engineers and architects on an idea that takes Sans Teacher to a whole other level. <laughs> um, and one that I'm very excited about. Uh, but Sans Teacher is what I would consider kind of like the first crude step into um, a very elegant early conversation that is just beginning, if that makes any sense. So um, the act is full of artfulness um, and the object is what it is. So I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm using this question not to challenge, but to Oh, no, I know. Maybe draw, draw you out more. So are you saying in some ways it's like Duchamp's urinal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the intention is definitely not cheeky and it's definitely not clever. And I'm definitely not looking to make any statement. Um, this was um, a manner for art to materially support something at a, at a location um, is unbelievable. <laughs> um, and um, I, I think that there, there is a lot to say behind the intention. Um, so it's not cheeky and it's not trying to be clever. Um, but it is maybe a very dull and matter of factness that has a certain, um, I don't know, a certain resonance, which is I am just absolutely headlong about banging on the material. <laughs> 
uh, there's this need to like bang on it so hard that um, uh, layers of definition start to kind of slough a bit and art can start to find new manners of um, citing and being and making its way and sharing in conversation of shared material and um, so that's kind of where it's at. I, I do have to say that um, other than tremendous intent, the process does kind of lead where it goes a bit, you know? And I, I wouldn't say that um, the next works to come at all uh, replicate what this was, which is having access to a blueprint and looking for this, this uh, way to materially uh, support um, realizing a, a star on earth. Certainly it wasn't going to be a sculpture on a lawn or a painting on the wall. It, I knew it had to be something different um, and it's not seen. And, and that's the best part of it. <laughs> that's the best part of it. This is so deeply embedded. Um, I mean, there's so many things about, where do you even begin? It's kind of absurd. I guess in many ways, but it's not at all meant to be that. And it's, it's sincerely not meant to be that. It's very there, quiet and, oh, go ahead. There, there, are, I know, there are a lot of other people here who have questions for you, but I, I, I need to ask you one more thing if that's, if you've indulged me. Um, when you were talking about the, uh, what were they, the, the cylinders that were formed by pressure. And, and it occurred to me because, you know, you're, you're talking about how, you know, we're all, we're all, it's all the same stuff. And I was starting to think about metamorphosis, you know, and Ovid, and um, how, you know, in different times, there were different, you know, narratives, by which to sort of explain or, or say the same thing. And then that led me to be thinking about, you know, Bernini and Apollo and Daphne and thinking about, you know, the marble that he's using is, is also formed by pressure uh, that, what, you know, so it's metamorphic material that is using to express metamorphosis, but, so, so there's something about some of the same concepts, but yours in 2020 takes a very different form, very minimalist, very um, materials based. Um, do you ever think about, you know, uh, or, you know, what do you think of you know, why you have to say something in the way that you're saying rather than, you know, here's a, Apollo chasing after Daphne turning into, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the tree. Um, that, that, you know, that there is some kind of aesthetic decision that is very much grounded in who we are in 2020, as opposed to who Bernini was in 1600 or whatever. To, to that exact point, I'm so glad everything that you're saying is always like prompting something. To that exact point, though, it does bring me back to the piano. And I think this would be a really tremendous insight to all of this. Beginning at the piano period is already putting um, me in a relationship with something larger than myself. And that instrument, I think of like the architect Louis Kahn saying, um, hammering away at the door of the sun, demanding an object, you know, for expression. I'm not interested in self-expression, but what is interesting about at the piano is not composing when you are playing Beethoven or you're playing Rachmaninoff, um, you're, you're playing over their hands. Uh, when you when you play their music, you're learning about their personage. You begin to understand them and their choices as human beings. So it's not, it can begin abstract, but it very soon becomes a personal conversation. But to your point about um, the different ways of how over time the same things are finding new interpretations, it's very much like at the piano where 
when I sit down to play a piece, um, here's my dog and cat. When I sit down to play a piece, what joins me is every other human being who's played that piece sitting at the keyboard. So there is something tremendous about that, right? Sharing that same, that same piece. Um, so I'm going to think about what you're saying in relationship to that, because I, I think that there's something, there's something there. And no. I think that also hammering away at what, what is uh, the, this new interest that's again coming back around and it's evolving just even that much more. And, um, and it has a much, it has a very large scope with it. Well, it makes you look at Bernini differently. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we tend to think of yeah. history as going this way, but, you know, history just goes as much back that way. Yeah. Uh, in that something that you do recasts and reframes how one might look at Bernini. So, maybe I'll, I'll back off now. Yeah, but let's see, because we're about 20 minutes left here. John? Yeah, Christine, um, first, I, I think there's something very beautiful what you just said about with, with piano. It's really a kind of conversation with the dead. Yes. Which is just very profound, I think. Um, I want to share with you something very personal of my reaction when I encountered Un at LACMA. Oh, okay. And as I approached, I thought, oh, this is an industrial scale object. Like, yeah, whatever, right? Yeah. And there was just an incredible experience of walking through it. It's like, well, the industrial just became cosmic. Mm. But even more, the object disappeared. Oh. So the sense of objecthood, that's really my question for you. It's like, it's objects, but they, they to me, they, they defy objecthood in some ways. And I, I don't know what that is. It's its own kind of transformative alchemy, I guess, there's something about metal and mental, the, the N, just mm -hmm. adding that in there in a parentheses that it was really quite transformative to engage with this work that I really, at first, I really was very dismissive yeah. as I approached it. It's like, yeah, yet another one of these, right? right. And then it just, your, your, your marking was really quite profound. So just wanted to share that. Thank you, pianist to pianist. <laughs> well, um, that's the same experience um, that I have myself. So, you know, we're all we're all seated on the same side of this table. I think we're all looking at this same thing. Um, and so uh, I'm I'm after that. And it's wonderful to hear that the experience is, is resonant with that questioning and that that journey. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I seek to further that, you know, uh, and I think the material is, is profound with it. Uh, the material has been so many things. It is maybe objectless in itself, of course, right? So there's a lot to that. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you. Wendy has something. Wendy? Christine, I loved learning about your work and how you think about it. And I was struck by many things you said, and like others, could ask a lot of questions, but I'll try, try to compact mine um, sort of into one I, um, that maybe we haven't talked about yet. I was really interested in you talking about the crude form of AI. And, um, and I was thinking about your interest in a kind of Lucretian atomism or monistic, you know, materialism of some sort. And, and I almost saw the way you talk about your work as being one that you talked about um, like temperature and pressure, but I, I, I wondered if your materials were more about compaction and dispersal and time and whether you sort of right experience yourself as, as a conduit for those universal forces. And John's question really just kind of brought that home to me as, as well, that, that when you talk about processing matter, I mean, that is, that's conceptual as what, you know, as processual. And um, here's just an interesting side note about the machine 
and its dispersal, the earliest meaning of the word machine actually involves mental processing. Um, the, the, the first um, OED citation is from the 14th century, and it's she machined in her mind, sort of machination or turning things over. So I wondered if you want to say anything about just that, you know, you keep coming back to dispersal and compaction and um, sort of sharing things across bodies. Um, so I guess, yeah, the monumental, of course, to, to monumentalize something is also to create an object in time. Um, so I wondered if you wanted to talk at all about compaction or time or dispersal. Well, that that is, um, that's the sum total, <laughs> that's the sum total of, of my artistic practice, period. So, um, uh, I think earlier when I was talking about that, that pace um, uh, aligning with that evolutionary pace or that cosmological pace, which is, you know, just to sit here and ponder a billion years, just for a moment, <laughs> you know, what that is like. But so that absolutely is uh, the dispersal um, and, the, and, and, the, and the recreation of, of uh, object after object. I mean, that is the quintessential artist practice, right? That studio practice, the sculptor practice over and over every day, every day, but on a cosmological context. Um, because the universe and the artist uses the same tools. Um, uh, so you definitely have highlighted something uh, so completely honest and, and compelling about the everyday practice um, in my studio. Um, and I love the, the machination that I, um, I'm taking a mental note of that mental metal note of that, um, for sure. Um, I'd like to write about that. That's really quite extraordinary. Uh, but it, certainly, um, to me, anything that, that points to the indifference of, of scale, that the, the intimacy that's indifferent to scale, but also that idea of, um, uh, as artists, all objects really are material phases of suns. Not only are they just material phases of suns, but that which made the sun itself, right? And made the sun before the sun. Um, many suns, like our sun is like a third generation sun or second generation sun. So. I mean, we could go on and on, right, about, um, about that. But um, that's kind of where I hang out, for sure. I hang out in that space. That's my practice. So thank you. Anybody else have anything? Gary. Thank you so much, Christine. <clears throat> like everyone else, I'm, yeah, just kind of thrilling um in learning about your work um this is a really open-ended just can you say more um I, I think i secretly sort of love when <clears throat> artists of any kind writers you know i'm a, I'm, I'm a dancer in my former life um use a sort of what we what we wouldn't call religious terms now because we're we have right an allergy to that we what we would probably call spiritual but you use that term devotional um mm. a number of times in your presentation to speak about i guess you're affective uh, maybe you might say your affective yes investment in the work that you're doing and i just wanted to ask if you would speak a bit more about that particular I don't know if you've thought much about using that particular term, but I'd just love to hear you speak about sure. that, um, orientation. So words are two things to me. Words are sounds, and then words carry meaning, right, for communication. Words is sounds to me. Whew. Okay, so <laughs> uh, there's what sounds good to say, and then there's what hits the mark of what you want to say. So devotional to me, regardless of how many ever ways of how it could be defined, it is at this moment a perfect word, one of maybe several words to describe um, the focus, the focus of my practice. So devotional 
to me and the way that I meant to use it means it has my full focus. I risk everything for it. <laughs> there's not a bit of me outside of it. And there's a meaning that, uh, there's a meaning to it that I can wake up to every day and there's way too much for me to be able to consume in any one given day. So therefore it is, it's not, oh, it's not a joy. I mean, like this is, this is not, I mean, anyway, you can wake up and you can continue that um, without a, a bit of you questioning why or not to. Um, so, so to me, devotional has, has that beautiful marriage of something that the sound of it is a testament also um, of saying it to the, the meaning in which I mean it, if that makes sense. Um, many of my early works, speaking of sound, uh, I would title just literally off of the English consonants and vowels of, of what that would sound like putting words together. You know, very much um, to the earlier point of the dispersals and the, and the reformings. It's same thing with language for me, for sure. And part of that too is living in different countries, learning different languages, learning that what I'm saying may never have, not only <laughs> is it may not have a perfect interpretation or translation in another language, but I mean, that's words itself, that's language itself, that's everything in itself. That's my perspective. That's how I see yellow and you see yellow and, you know, and it goes on and on and on, right? So <clears throat> there's just like, there's so much to do. <laughs> there's just so much to do. <laughs> Literally, there's every, at every layer, this, this topic is so rich, which is why I'm so grateful that Taney has brought us all together because here we are, you know, in this grid, but um, is to talk about this, <laughs> you know, the layers of this, the, you know, it's not one person, you know, we got a lot on our plates. Yeah. Yeah. 10 days is hardly enough, but you know, it's a start. Yeah. It's a start. Which is why it's so exciting to be in conversation together. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions or anything they want to say? Daniel? Uh, yeah. Um, also, thank you. So, so interesting. I, I wonder if you could talk about form. Um, do, do you think about form when you're, you're making a piece? Um, you know, I try to picture you in your studio and I picture, you know, a helmet and flames and, you know, <laughs> these, this metal and, and I, I love the way you talk about um, your relationship to materials and um, the curves and the forms that are in your work. Are they all a consequence of temperature and pressure? Or do you find yourself painting with the material, guiding the material? Uh, so the first part, thank you. That's so great. Uh, the first part of it is, um, you know, I guess really, if I think about it, I, I think I've lost sight of form. <laughs> I think that's a great way of like kind of tying together a lot of these questions. Um, I need to think about what I just said, but let's just say I said that, okay? So I've lost all sight of form. I think that's pretty true. I think what I'm more interested in is how to further this, um, this material conversation, this shared fundamental clay, um, what I mean when I say the material, what I mean when I say an intimacy indifferent to scale, what I mean to say, you know, all of this on and on, that's where my focus is. So the form, maybe kind of like how John was saying, it's maybe a little more elusive. It's coming and going. It's not, it's not as much of a priority, but as a sculptor, that really engages me. Like, wow, you're really short. You keep short circuiting <laughs> what a sculptor does all the time. Um, so I, I think that keeps me going in that way. Um, the materials, it just is fully engaging. Uh, so I'm, I'm after that. So maybe I'm not so interested in form. Maybe not as much as I was when I first started because Oon definitely had a lot of thought to its form. So the curving, that part of your question. Uh, 
perhaps this also includes time, maybe getting kind of back into that a little bit. But since the work is conceived and constructed for touch, we haven't really talked too much about that, but the works allow touch. Uh, the touch is remembered on the surface from the oils of your hands that rest the surface. The surface actually leaves on your hand too. So there's like that whole thing going on. But uh, the curvature was a way of um, allowing the form to have contact with sight and also with person. And naturally it just kept the, the curving was something that was happening, um, but also suspending passage and still having the form somewhat in that automatically was like curving it. I also think that um, as I was working dimensionally, then of course, like I was constantly curving. There was this aspect of bringing time and memory in and was constantly curving the form. But I would say right around 2008 or 2009, I think I just started to kind of walk away from it all together in a way. I mean, honestly, I, I don't sit anymore and s s sketch sculpture. This is horrible to say, <laughs> but it's true. I don't do it like that anymore. But Oon and Known and uh, 20 works all were of that note, you know, the, the, that mark making that suspended a form between states, material, you know, as, as solid and liquid. Um, I, I guess that was a body of work. And once I left that, I think I did leave form with that. And now I'm on to this other thing, which kind of gets to the M30 and the Sans Teter and the kind of troublemaking, totally inherent to that. And, you know, where we're going from there. But it's, it's something that I, I can't help but feel is, is so completely shared by so many of us working today. Um, so I'm hoping that this is, this is obviously a shared conversation. This isn't just one person talking about something that's so completely unfamiliar with maybe many things that we're all thinking. I do know Jane and I are thinking alike. I <laughs> know that I know where you are. <laughs> and of course, John in our past. Um, Anyone else? Jane, you were typing something a second ago. Thank you, Daniel. Jane, were you Thank typing you. something? I, I was just saying this walking away from form, is that what you meant when you said that at one point you became completely material focused? Because I was going to ask, yeah. what, what's the otherwise to being material focused? Maybe it's form focused? I, I, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just evolved. I, I guess I evolved out of it. Starting off as a painter, right? It's like, what am I painting? Then I lost interest in that because the pigment was just so fascinating to me making paint. So then I was all about the paint. This is just like an Alice in Wonderland thing. So then I was in the paint and then the paint took me to the elements and the elements are like, you're totally screwed. <laughs> like This is where you're going to be the rest of your life. So, you know, making form from that and then kind of losing interest again. So maybe this is important, you know, like, because like, what's next, you know? Um, so folks, what are we doing? <laughs> what's next for us? I think it's interesting, I just want to throw in there that, that in art, form and matter are kind of conflated, you know? Um, so it's actually rather confusing. Uh, was that maybe your, part of your point, Jane? Was like, Oh, they're sorry. without form, right? Say again, Tammy. Were you? Um, I'm saying that it's puzzling and and confusing that in art, form and matter are conflated. Okay, when we say form, we mean uh, uh, embodied matter, right? I mean embodied form. You mean, mean embodied form? Um, yeah, I don't actually. I never quite got that. I mean, I I'm not in the art. I mean, I'm just sort of amateur in the in the vocabulary of the art art uses usages of the terms but i was thinking like form is like something that more the artist it's the shaping activity of the of the artist on the on the materials hmm. rather than the materials also doing the shaping so that i was maybe invoking the form matter distinction differently than you would um in my sort of philosophy world 
form is what people do and matter is what you put the form on top of. Yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah, that's great. I don't think of it like that way, in that way, but that, that's really interesting. Um, so it is about five minutes. So isn't it like, you know, I was just thinking, you have to be conscious of something, right? Consciousness has to have an object in yes. a sense. And, and so you, I mean, maybe you can look at, you know, the relationship of form and matter in that sense, right? Um, it's the of part. I, I definitely, if, if there was to be a focus, so <clears throat> if it's not form, then I would say it's definitely the multidisciplinary. Um, but what trumps the multidisciplinary still, sorry to say, it is, it is, it is the matter, it is the fundamental clay, it is, it is the shared material, it's a shared medium, the elemental architecture. Um, I think maybe as sculptor, as artist, um, I get so involved in the material, in, so involved in the marble. Um, I, I mean, I, I lose, I, I think I lose my, my track of, my train of thought every time I just even start to enter into it, enter into the medium of it. But uh, there is more there there. And, um, and I think it's really important. And uh, at this moment in time too, kind of like this, this whole notion of earth is separate from space. When we talk about the moon and we talk about Mars and, and it's like this exotic thing that's like space and it's so spacey. <laughs> well, that's what we are, you know, and, um, there's just this adamant, incessant inseparability of this fundamental clay that uh, persists and um, it's not individualized, um, but it's shared. And I think that it's changing practice because it's multidisciplinary. And I think that it's informing form and, you know, I don't know. You know, I, 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 it's a 2020 thing. <laughs> well, I, I think of sometimes, you know, one of our fascinations with art and art making is, you know, like, as you're saying, it's, we're, we're both matter, right? And we're made of the same matter. But, you know, at what point does that stuff that you're making in artwork become more than just the matter? becomes the artwork and it's with us we're you know we're stuff but it's still a mystery for us at one point do we become more than just that stuff whether you think of it as a soul or a thought uh and i don't know maybe that's why you know we just are so caught up with this art making because of that that mystery when does matter become more than matter where is the consciousness, right? Yeah. Well, soon there'll be stars out there saying, man, I was human. That was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, Christine, this has been wonderful, really. Thank you so much. Um, I don't want to cut it. I mean, I'm, I'm fine, you know, uh, continuing on, but I feel like it, it, we're kind of reaching What's it out. What's the chatting thing? Yeah, Chris, that's Charlie. Um, I just appreciated this presentation so much. I have a feeling this is going to become a very memorable day the more I think about um, the paintings. And I know there are all called paintings with the sculpture, but also the language, Christine, that you use is, is uh, so fresh. You know, I've been involved in tracking this whole idea coming out of cosmological physics since the late 70s. And it sometimes seems the way it's talked about by the cosmologists, it's just kind of tired and what more can you say? And so I love the fact that you would um, call the unitive dimension 
uh, in the cosmological realm, intimacy, an intimacy that's indifferent to all kinds of separations and distinctions, not only scale. Yeah. And it, it just feels, I don't want to make too much of this, but in, in my embodied thinking, it feels like there's some connection by why you would choose the word intimacy for this unitive dimension, which is a wonderful choice. Intimacy and the curvature in the work that keeps coming, curvature is always coming up. Um, so I just offer that and thank you so much for this day. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for keeping the sun. She's our, I think our only West Coast person. We have lots of sun now, we need rain this winter. Okay. Does anyone else have anything for Christine? Okay, well, I imagined um, we, will, we will be talking about this in the forum tomorrow um, a bit. It's, uh, it's been wonderful. It's a lot to think about. Um, yeah, it's, it's thank you so much, Christine, for taking the time. Really much appreciated. I can't think of a better artist to have here in this uh, conference of ours. So really, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending so much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. It was great. Thank you, everybody. And I can send you an essay about the machine, yes. the machine thing um, on our site or via Taney or something. Please. All right. What about on the site? That would be, that'd be fantastic. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, on the site. Yes, let's, yeah. Exactly. Let's everybody gets it. Yep. Thank okay. you, everybody. So I will be seeing all of you soon online. All right. And hopefully on Wednesday as well. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Oh, there are chats here that I didn't quite get to.